All right, let's get started. Yeah. Uh, Trends in AI by Zeta Alpha. Uh, my name is Jakub Zabral. I'm the founder of uh, the company. And we're really excited to uh, bring the monthly roundup of everything that has happened. And it's been just an astonishing month again. We were rounding up the news for the month and news that was three weeks old seemed just like ages ago. Yeah. So I'm Dinos, I'm an AI researcher here at Alpha, and as Jakob said, uh, we'll try to pack everything we can in one hour, but it's not going to be the full cover-up of the month, but uh, hopefully the important stuff will stick with you. Uh, so what did we have this month? Uh, if you can remember. Uh, lots of stuff. I think uh, there was NVIDIA's uh, GDC conference. That was a pretty big one, but it seems like such a long time ago. Okay. So we have um, uh, lots of drama again. As, as usual now, in the frontier labs and uh, big companies, things tend to not stay very stagnant. Uh, That's good for the outsiders. <laughs> lots of uh, new papers, uh, lots of um, uh, startup funding, um, some really new companies with funny websites. We'll get there. Um, so let's dive right in. I think this was one of the biggest uh, sort of uh, Game of Thrones uh, uh, like um, uh, episodes of uh, this month. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, Microsoft announced that um, they were going to uh, do a very large capital investment in uh, the OpenAI partnership. And um, basically, uh, they broke ground for this new data center, which is about to cost about $10 billion uh, for purely AI compute uh, and, and OpenAI serving. So they clearly see that demand in the market. And on top of that, they announced that they were going to scale that up even um, uh, 10 times to $100 billion in just pure compute. And this reminds me a lot of that uh, rumor that was going around that uh, Sam was asking for six or seven trillion to build the, the new AI chip. Maybe this is a more watered down and realistic so maybe version. They, maybe they just want to build 70 of these data centers. So I just did a quick um, math. So. If you look at how many GPUs this is, this is roughly um, uh, 5 million GPUs for for this thing. And I think all those investing in NVIDIA must have been really happy because uh, <laughs> it's like a bump, <laughs> nice stick in the, in the stock uh, market for, for NVIDIA. Uh, it's still until Sam Altman gets his 7 trillion, it yeah. still looks like like most of this money actually going to uh, end up with NVIDIA, right? That's true, yeah. But no, not necessarily, depending on it how we see the... There are some developments, yeah. absolutely. Um, so uh, there it was uh, NVIDIA's GTC, as we uh, already said. Um, um, uh, Jensen Wang uh, announced the uh, uh, Blackwell chip. Yeah. It's a beast, right? And it has a pretty uh, smiley face here in the picture. Everyone is, was commenting about that. So AI is getting in personal in more than one census. But uh, I think they also presented a, a few more uh, features and uh, orchestration systems that revolves around AI. So this was not just a product release. It was yeah. uh, kind of positioning themselves into AI at the forefront. Yeah, and really building these whole data centers with, um, um, I think this system down here has about... 30,000 uh, nodes, and yeah, that's really designed to uh, scale up to this next version of uh, multi-trillion parameter uh, models. Right, and I think we don't have it here in the screenshots, but they also uh, shared a bit in their progress into the robotics division that they started, the lab that is in NVIDIA, uh, but we do have some papers on that. So. We'll go more into robotics, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Uh, but going a little bit deeper into this Blackwell chip, so it's essentially like two, uh, it more than doubles the, the uh, transistor count over the H100, uh, but it's essentially like two packages uh, being glued together really tightly. And there's a Dutch company, uh, Pacey, which makes exactly that technology of, of hybrid bonding of, uh, of chips. Uh, so uh, I'm not an investor, uh, <laughs> uh, investment consultant, but uh, watch that company. Um, what else do we have in hardware? Um, well, I think there's serious funding and development going in uh, encountering this uh, monopoly and hegemony of uh, NVIDIA. 
um, one of the companies that's doing a fairly good job at capturing some um, attention and uh, market share uh, as well is uh, Cerebras. Right. And we've included them in the past few months as they're growing in the mentions in the literature and also the developments that they've, they've had. Absolutely. They yeah, also they... had a, a, a Cerebras day in the past few weeks. Yeah, and they unveiled this new generation uh, which is actually an even much larger chip. So, chip. so it's not actually a chip, it's a whole wafer. Uh, so they produce these wafer scale uh, accelerators uh, that have uh, up to 4 trillion uh, transistors. So that's, uh, I think, um, uh, 20 times bigger than the, the NVIDIA uh, Blackwell. Yeah, if that picture is anything but stock, then it, it speaks to itself. <laughs> it's, a, it's a monster. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we'll see uh, how that lands in the market. Um, what's this with tiny box AMD? Yeah, AMD is... yeah. So AMD is notorious for um, not exactly being the go-to choice for AI uh, workloads, and I think this is one of the reasons. In the past, there was there has been a lot of instability in uh, in training systems or just using them for AI workloads, and this is what uh, George Holt's company Tiny Corp found when building this tiny box. So this tiny box is what they offer as a uh, all-in-one package where you can deploy your AI solutions on. Mm -hmm. And now they only offer NVIDIA and they were thinking of developing an, uh, an, an AMD only box, but they were running into issues, uh, as I said, on instability. But uh, they've had some talks with AMD. The kind of key to solve this riddle was not coming first hand from AMD, but from a random uh, repository on GitHub, I believe. It just took five days for yeah. that to reverse uh, the the. I guess that's policy. some pressure, and uh, yeah. uh, for the consumer, what this means is that there is now a box that's ten thousand uh, USD cheaper than the NVIDIA one, just because it's running on AMD hardware. So cool. Let's prove that uh, some uh, some options helps everyone, but NVIDIA, I guess. So there's um, NVIDIA, there's Cerebras, there's AMD competing, but there's some new guys as well. Well, there's some Altman, but let's, uh, I don't think he raised that money yet. Um, and uh, he might never uh, get around to it. But uh, uh, there's uh, this uh, chip startup called Halo, uh, which is um, uh, has just raised 120 million in funding. And, uh, Basically, it's a it's an AI accelerator for the edge, kind of more competing with the um, Nvidia, Jetson, and, and and those kind of smaller uh, cards. Um, but interestingly, they have um, managed to run Llama seven billion parameters with ten tokens per second, with only five watts of power. That's pretty so good. That's uh, I think um, pretty decent performance uh, at the. Uh, um, energy consumption 100 times less than the NVIDIA cards. So I think that's very promising. Um, and um, another um, um, announcement about funding was SEMA AI, which uh, got a little bit less, $70 million of funding to uh, build a uh, multimodal specialized uh, chip so for large multimodal yeah, although everything is based on the transformer architecture these days, uh, still, I guess there's potential to, to be tapped on when you build uh, specifically not just for text tokens, but all the intricacies that the new architecture is going to have. Mixing all the different types of tokens and uh, yeah. Uh, so that leads us to more funding news. Um, well, in robotics, uh, well, it's kind of robotics, right? Uh, Self-driving cars. Applied intuition uh, got the big funding round, kind of boring. Uh, Anthropic got another funding round. It's like the same use every month, right? Well, it's uh, almost $3 billion that Amazon is pouring into them. And I think a few months ago, we also discussed this three or four billion that was going again from Amazon to Anthropic. I think it's, they stand at four yeah, yeah. Uh, billion total, so, including yeah, uh, this yeah. investment, and Google also invested. And um, yeah, you could see it like uh, the um, the bonus for releasing Cloud Three, right? It's a recurring check to keep using uh, Amazon as a backend and all that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, together, AI, a uh, uh, I guess a competitor of Amazon, you could say, right? Or are they hosting on Amazon? Mm, I have no clue, but uh, they're specializing a lot on infrastructure and inference endpoints, right? Yeah. 
So they got a large funding round and a nice um, um, kind of seed uh, investment. I'm not sure what the amount was. Uh, it's a new robotics company called Physical Intelligence, uh, which got backing by um, OpenAI, uh, Sequoia, and uh, Tesla Ventures. Um, and you say, oh, what's uh, what's the big deal there? Um, well, it's a pretty star-studded team, and they can afford to launch the company with this as their website. It's the only page on their website. It's pretty cool. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it include the the team includes Chelsea Finn and uh, uh, Sergey Levine. So I think they have a pretty solid um, research background to start building some really cool robotics. And I think they're probably going to include OpenAI's multimodal models. Yeah, we see OpenAI well. actually differentiating in a few uh, vendors for robotics. Uh, there's also Figure that they collaborated with. Yeah. So yeah, they're that is completely new. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, team being launched. Uh, so in news, uh, this made a lot of uh, uh, hysteria online on the social networks. Devin, the first uh, AI software engineer, is it the first one? I'm not sure if I would call it the first one. Uh, surely the first one that created such a big wave and probably the marketing approach that they took was the, the one that impressed people. Yeah, it was really like a good marketing yeah. campaign. Uh, and then they made all the newspapers and uh, everybody who had been until now um, telling their kids, please uh, so learn, <laughs> start learning coding. <laughs> now, like flip flopped and said, please stop learning coding. It's over. <laughs> yeah. And, but I think uh, a telltale sign that this is not over yet for computer science students is uh, cognition, the, the company behind Devon, they're still hiring. So they, <laughs> they haven't solved it <laughs> internally. Yeah, more on that. Um, so, yeah, this was a very smartly executed marketing campaign. Uh, what the um, uh, what the uh, Devin agent actually does is uh, is a little bit more than Copilot, mm -hmm. right? Just completing uh, pieces of code in one file. It kind of goes acro across the whole code base with a specific goal uh, to um, to create uh, larger structures or fix problems as well. In the right, and it's code. a lot more mixed initiatives. So it you ask for a task, then it's going to do something, fetch some website documentation and so on. Ask if this is right, if this is wrong, if that's what you want, and then continue. Yeah. Have you tried it out? No, I haven't. Uh, but I've seen that a lot of uh, competitors started popping up left and right, since apparently this is a very lucrative and an interesting idea to many. Uh, so it's definitely an interesting idea. Uh, there's also some more uh, research-oriented mm -hmm. uh, uh, progress on this. So there was this Autodef paper uh, just a few weeks ago from a group at Microsoft Research, uh, which I think they benchmark with Devin as well. It's about uh, similar. And there's this open source initiative called um, Software Engineering Agent by a group at uh, Princeton University. And uh, they also benchmark against Devin. And I think they're, they're showing here that they're uh, pretty close with mm -hmm. the open source initiative. So, um, um, is it um, a revolution? Well, I think it's an interesting development, but as um, the pragmatic engineer blog uh, pointed out, everything on the uh, on the uh, Cognition AI uh, Devin website is created using existing software packages. So it can't be that good yet. Working on it. Well, you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. That's, that's, that's sure. true. Build or buy. <laughs> um, exciting developments also in uh, AI generated music, right? Yeah, and this also took my feet by storm. Uh, basically, it's two companies. I'm, I'm not sure if soon existed before or if it's, it's been upcoming. I guess, I hadn't I guess heard of them before. since it's a V3, it's, it's been around for a while, but yeah. now they really broke through with this uh, new V3 model. I don't think there's a another name behind it, it's just their V3 model. And what it does is basically generate uh, up to two or three minute songs. Uh, but what stands them out from the rest is that it really sounds like a song that you would find on Spotify. It's a song that has lyrics. Of course, it's generated in two steps, so it sounds 
it no, has, no, because there yeah. is some plot behind the lyrics. It has like a real, it, it sounds like there's a real person exactly. that wrote the yeah. music, basically. Yeah, right? so it's, it's not like a one-shot generation. And a real voice yeah. that with, with really nice It's quality. not generated as, as in a waveform. First, you have to actually generate lyrics that make mm -hmm. sense, that people will say, okay, what's up with these lyrics? Uh, they're not like they're not super brand new or super interesting, but they do sound legitimate. And the, uh, I think from f a few audios that I've listened to, I could definitely see, see someone not realizing that it's AI in a few a few months. Or it's gone completely viral. Yeah. Um, uh, random uh, friends and and ex colleagues started messaging me with songs that they wrote, mm -hmm. and uh, they're not even in AI. Uh, uh, very nice. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, St Stability uh, released their V2 of uh, Stable Audio. And this one, uh, as you also pointed out before to me, it's, it sounds a bit more bland, more generic. Uh, I, I, songs I, probably, uh, I thought it background. was more like uh, elevator music, yeah. basically. Yeah. But it's they also, pretty good quality. It is high quality. Uh, it is commercially licensed. So uh, I think with a subscription of $5 per month, you can use everything in your commercial projects. Mm -hmm. And another feature I really like Nick, is now they have a YouTube live stream that plays music, twenty four seven. That's never elevator been heard. music. That's never been heard before. <laughs> well, I uh, so far I prefer uh, uh, Sudo, uh, but that's not the case for a lot of very uh, uh, well known artists. So I think this this viral uh, wave around Sudo really woke up a lot of mm -hmm. very uh, uh, serious people from the music industry. And uh, there's kind of a revolution against this software brewing. Um, so there's this um, letter, not for pausing AI for six months, but for um, kind of being very careful that it doesn't destroy human creativity in music. Um, on the side of being responsible and, and regulating AI, um, it sounds already like such a long time ago, it was on the 13th of March, uh, the EU finally, uh, the EU Parliament finally approved uh, the um, uh, European AI Act. Pretty big moment! Yay! Europe's big... lead. Europe leads the world in regulation. <laughs> and a pretty big PDF that dropped with that. That's right. We have it in Zeta Alpha. It's I think 459 pages, and you can chat in Zeta Alpha with it and ask questions about the law. It's not a legal advice. <laughs> it's a, uh, so basically, what we've discussed the EU AI Act many times before is a kind of risk-based framework where different categories of applications um, are either limited or requirements are put uh, on the on the process to to roll them out to customers. It actually, mostly a kind of consumer protection mm -hmm. uh, law. Uh, so uh, European AI companies and the EU thinks by sort of by um, uh, extension uh, of the European influence, also global companies that uh, want to sell their products in Europe will have to comply. Uh, so we've made a really kind of handy lookup table when what will happen. So now it's approved by the European Parliament. It still has to be published officially. So it's being like checked for typos and uh, and formatting errors, and then it will be published in the official journal of the EU somewhere in April now. And 20 days after that publication, the law goes into uh, force. And then the first real um, enforcement is going to start in uh, the fall of this year, where some of the prohibited practices uh, will actually be banned from the date on. Um, interestingly, uh, the law defines these kind of high-risk applications, uh, like uh, credit scoring, uh, profiling for recruitment, and things like that. And um, those don't go into effect until uh, 36 months later. So I think we'll have the singularity by then, roughly, and AGI, but uh, the European Union will start to regulate AI and recruitment in April 2027. Uh, I think leading up to that, many large companies will already comply uh, earlier to be in line. Um, so this is a pretty consistent course of regulation that the EU has been preparing for a while. India last month announced a rather uh, rash uh, uh, measure of regulating in a, in a weird way. I would right? say very intimidating for any developer that wants to launch in India. Any developer, any startup yeah. had to uh, get... Um, approval before approval they... without knowing the rules 
from the Ministry uh, of uh, Digital Affairs or yeah. So, so basically, what they said is, if you want to deploy something that has AI, then you need to uh, ask for approval before you ever deploy it. Hmm? But it's bad. Yeah. Thanks. Right. So uh, thankfully, they took this back. So uh, no longer uh, are developers worried that they're going to lose access to to such a big market, really. Um, and I think this is going to just going to continue in the in the way that the EU is leading. Uh, what do you think, Jacob? Is is people are people going to follow also in the United States, or is this going to be uh, a schism be, be, between who does what? Well, I think eventually these kind of regulations will kind of converge, mm -hmm. but. Um... Uh, yeah, I think right now everybody in um, in uh, uh, government is kind of uh, a little bit um, flip flopping, uh, trying to figure it out, and the market is just moving a lot faster than any of the regulation. Um, so let's dive into model releases. Right, we rounded it up for this month, and this also feels like quite old news by now, but. Uh, surprisingly, Grok One has been open sourced after a bit of back and forth with. OpenAI and Elon Musk saying that this is uh, something that humanity needs to have access on. So they went ahead and released Grok One as a uh, So what, what, what is roughly the, the capability and, and the size of that model? Uh, it's a huge model. It's a 300 billion parameter mixture of experts. Right. Uh, so that makes it, I think, a bit bigger than the mixed role open source model that we had. Although in capabilities, I would not uh, say it's a bit, it's a lot further. So it's uh, in this area where we now see these huge models dropping between GPT 3.4 and uh, 3.5 and 4. So they felt kind of safe to open source it because nobody can run it on their own uh, kit. That's, and, uh, that's very and it's likely. not that good anyway. And right? also they had an, another ace up their sleeves, which came, uh, I think, exactly one week after, which is uh, Grok 1.5, which yep. is still slowly rolling out to uh, X Premium users. Uh, this one, of course, is not open source. I don't know how uh, Elon can decide that Grok1 deserves to be open source, but 1.5 won't be. Uh, again, in performance, there's this uh, chart below on the usual suspects like MLU, math capabilities, and programming. And, Does it stack up pretty nicely? Um, I guess so. They're comparing against GPT-4, the original ver uh, version that dropped in right. la last year, and they seem to be on par or even a bit better in some uh, metrics. Uh, so definitely a very capable mo uh, model behind a very capable team that developed it. Um, but I don't know, I'm not sure I would pick it over some other candidates that we have nowadays, like uh, Cloud3 Opus or 4.5 Turbo, but we'll see. Um, and again, staying on the open source side, uh, and I guess at a kind of surprising drop, uh, Databricks released another Titan of a model which they call DBRX, which I guess is- I thought they were betting on this uh, stable LM uh, mm -hmm. model, right? They they acquired that a while ago. Is that the same team that- No, stable LM from, is from Stability. Oh, sorry. Uh, but no, they uh, uh, what, from what? MPT, from Mosaic. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, well, Mosaic was on the 7B side. Now they also dropped a huge model, uh, which is in the multi hundred billion parameters, uh, mixture of expert scale. And they do again, uh, scale competitively with uh, Llama 2 and Mistral and Grok 1. I think this dropped a bit before 1.5 dropped. So again, a very capable and large open source model for people to, to use. Yeah. I'm not sure it's going to be viable at this scale. So good go-to replacement for Llama 2 at least. Llama 2, yes, for yeah. sure. But you already had the Mistral. Exactly. It was open yeah. source. So it's all about trading. Is this, uh, is this worth scaling up? Because you also need a huge... Uh, cluster to run this on, or am I still covered by the normal use cases that you can get with uh, well, data, single? Databricks into, is in the business of huge clusters, so uh, I think they're uh, uh, the bigger, the they're more than willing to operate. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, moving on to uh, kind of benchmarking. Right. So uh, we have a new kind of benchmark for reward models. So reward models are, are what's commonly used in this fine tuning process of aligning with human expectations and human uh, judgments yeah, that uh, like instruction instruct GPT today. popularized. Yeah. So we now see a lot of open source and open weight models to also be fine tuned with uh, reinforcement learning. And this is the model that kind of powers this, uh, this capability. And there's a benchmark now for openly accessible or private uh, reward models that people can use and uh, fine tune their models with. Uh, 
Cohere's model is on the top, even surpassing GPT-4 uh, Turbo. But again, this is a specialized reward model. The other one is just using GPT-4 as a reward model. Uh, but this, this has been quite a common practice nowadays. Right, and this is a simple supervised benchmark, yeah, basically. Yeah. So it's basically right. seeing uh, on cases where the model should really say, no, don't do this, yeah. if it actually says, or if it's right. more strict, more loose. Yeah. So, so I think most of the state-of-the-art models are nowadays uh, evaluated without a, a gold standard, mm -hmm. right? Not even on a common benchmark, but more on um, this sort of uh, uh, ELO-style leaderboards. Um, so last month we said Cloud4 is actually better than GPT-4, is dethroning as the, as the most capable model. And in fact, on the uh, chatbot arena leaderboard, um, where pairs of model uh, responses are uh, A-B tested mm -hmm. uh, for human preference without uh, people knowing which model is which one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a really slight edge, 1255 against 1252 recently uh, over GPT-4. So it's official now. It's the best model. Yeah, and I think what's also interesting here is seeing how the rest of the variants of Cloud3 are creeping up. So Sonnet is still above the original GPT-4, and Haiku is also uh, above the one of the right. versions that they Which offer. Which is a really small, it's really a very fast, small model. Really cheap it's, model and multi-model. Right? It's multi-model, and I think it's faster and cheaper or at the range of GPT 3.5 Turbo. Yeah, so and it's and really... it has a very long context. Yeah. 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 So good alternative. Uh, what I find slightly concerning for those open source uh, uh, builders out there, uh, the top 10 is now, again, uh, almost completely um, uh, proprietary, except for the Quen model from Alibaba. So uh, push it a little bit harder, open source guys. Um, so we uh, last month we uh, reported also on the drop of inflection 2.5. I think that was their last drop, uh, and it didn't show up on the uh, LMC's chatboard arena. In fact, the whole company kind of imploded, and uh, the um, one of the founders, uh, Mustafa Suleiman, was hired by Microsoft. Uh, to lead their AI division. Yet so another subdivision that's going to be product focused, I think. Yeah, here it say, still says consumer AI division. Later, I think it was clarified. It was more like the the, the co-pilot mm -hmm. uh, line of products. And uh, with him, um, uh, the, uh, the technical co-founder, Karen, also uh, went to Microsoft and most of the team. So it was uh, what they what um, uh, Satya Nadella originally had plotted for uh, open AI takeover without any shares being exchanged is, is being done right here. And later, actually, it turned out there was a deal behind it mm -hmm. and the shareholders are being compensated because uh, Reid Hoffman, who was one of the, co uh, the, the uh, investors be between uh, Inflection, is actually on the board of Microsoft and is the founder of LinkedIn, which is also part of Microsoft. So it's kind of like a sanction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, okay. It's a, transaction. It's a kind of mafia deal among <laughs> equals, I think. Uh, uh, so uh, this pattern of uh, uh, very high-profile CEOs leaving their startups uh, has has more uh, members uh, this club this month. Um, what happened? So I think uh, nobody saw this coming, but Imad Mostak just left stability. He was uh, under pressure already for a long time, right? That is true, but I think that's not what broke him. It's more like uh, the, the vision of the company and where, I don't know if it's investors or internally, the agreement is that sometime they need, they need sometimes soon they need to monetize the products and their lineup and start having maybe some proprietary uh, models and uh, all behind a paywall, but I don't think that's what uh, Imad's vision for the company was. So I guess that's where they split. And what he said at the moment he left is, uh, I like stability, I hope they do well, but now it's time to democratize AI. So, right. Well, there were rumors the company is financially kind of uh, oh, heading towards a cliff. So that might have had something to do with it mm -hmm. just as well. Uh, but there's indeed a, a long interview worth watching. Uh, he's a very good speaker and a very clear thinker um, with, um, um, what's the name of the, the 
Peter Diamandis, and um, uh, it's an hour-long interview. Um, and uh, yeah, he kind of claims indeed that it's more the philosophical direction and the vision of the company and that he wants to do something more open. Uh, worth watching. Uh, more model releases. This is kind of in the trend of European countries, uh, all wanting to have their digital sovereignty and training their own um, LLMs. So I think most European countries are kind of uh, starting to pour money into this. And the recipe is typically something like this. Let's make a Mistral style model and have it perform really well on English, in our programming language. code and our own language. I, I don't know if this is a winning recipe. Like who who wants to pick a different model for every language in a multilingual world? I don't really believe in this vision. Uh, but still, it's good to kind of um, you know as a as a etude as a uh, 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 exercise for for um, the skills of uh, the, the local teams to uh, to be, to have the capabilities to train these kind of models and to know all the tricks and to have the compute infrastructure and hopefully it will eventually come together into some kind of open source movement in Europe where uh, very capable large models for all the languages will be trained. So this is a drop by uh, Silo AI, Finnish company, which um, uh, produced a capable model called the Viking, um, which is um, good in English and code and Finnish. No, it's a bit more of Scandinavian. Oh, Scandinavian. Sorry, Finnish, Swedish. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm exaggerating a little bit. What I found interesting, it was trained on the um, Lumi supercomputer in Finland. And that is one of the uh, uh, largest supercomputers, which is not NVIDIA based. So it was trained on over a thousand AMD chips. So apparently that works as well. Uh, I think George was maybe complaining a little bit too much. He should have uh, asked for that. asked for help in <laughs> Finland. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the model drops on the generative side. Uh, we see that it's kind of diverging. That there are different teams and companies working more on the retrieval side, right? Obviously, retrieval augmented generation is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Different models are being used for the generative part and for vector search and, and the retrieval. Uh, so what do we have here? Right, so I think a newcomer to the whole field is this uh, mixed bread AI company. Yeah, that's this MXBAI. It's a it's a pretty tiny startup, so a team of about five people in Berlin. Right, but they've uh, been working nonstop for the past month or so, a bit, I guess a bit earlier before the drops, but yeah. uh, they've bombarded us with a bunch of releases that's quite competitive on the top of the MTIB uh, benchmark. So they have a large model that is a dense uh, model. They have a Colbert variant. They also have a model that supports uh, Matryoshka learning. And I think they also have a ranker product. And they have a very cool company name, it Mixed is. Bread. Yeah. Uh, and they call themselves Bakers. I, I also so noticed. All the, all the <laughs> research engineers have as an official job title on LinkedIn, Baker. And, and on, the bread. on their blog posts as well, yeah. because I was seeing uh, who is in, in involved in each article and it said Baker, Baker. I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> some very skilled bakers in the- So in I interviewed company. actually uh, uh, one of the bakers and uh, in our neural search talks, we have uh, uh, an interview with them uh, upcoming. It's a very cool model, uh, especially because they also um, uh, tagged on to this recent trend that um, dense retrieval models um, produce embeddings that are very capable of being binarized mm -hmm. so that you can actually do dense retrieval with um, um, yeah, simple bit uh, vector manipulation. It's much faster, less storage. Right. Um, if we go to multimodal, you also interviewed uh, the founder of Unum who released Uform this week, Yeah, uh, which is a, a variety of multimodal embedding models. Uh, yeah, so that's more um, a, a multimodal and multilingual mm -hmm. uh, embedding model. Uh, so it's kind of a, a clip replacement, right. you could say, a more modern and more performant uh, replacement for clip that's also multilingual. 
And they are also quite small, right? Is Click good at multilingual? I'm not sure. Mm, I, think I think it's so. mostly trained on English. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, so this one supports about um, 15 or 20 languages. Unfortunately, not Dutch and not Czech. I don't know about <laughs> Greek. So we all can complain. Uh, uh, I did already. Um, and um, finally, in the embedding space, we have Splate uh, V3, which is not a dense model. But a sparse model, right? So Splate in, in general just takes in as input a sentence or whatever uh, piece of text you have, and then it produces the most relevant uh, tokens that are, that you can uh, use with a classical inverted index. That is kind of works as a query expansion or just uh, yeah, contextualizes yeah, yeah. the words that are present in that. Yeah, you, you don't need to keep the vectors in memory. You can just use it in a classical index, um, and. Um, uh, there's now a new category evolving, which is actually models that are not embedding models and not purely generative models, but they're kind of generative models specialized in retrieval event generation, right? Right. So uh, first, Cohere announced their int8 and binary embeddings, as you discussed, yeah. which uh, is just using during training, knowing how to use all the different types of quantization that will, you will encounter at inference. And then later, I think a few weeks after, a few days after, they uh, announced the original commander model, uh, which is uh, a permissively licensed for research uh, that is, as you said, optimized towards rag use. So the model knows when it's being given context from retrieval. It knows how to cite the passages, uh, how to use tools, and so on. And I think just yesterday or two days ago, they released an even larger model, which is called commander plus. So R plus is really just a larger version of exactly. the R, which again right. is open source for uh, research purposes. I think this one is uh, 100 billion parameters. Yeah, something. Uh, like and it's very competitive uh, in tool use and normal uh, language modeling tasks with uh, the big models that you could expect, like GPT four. Uh, but I think they also benchmarked. Uh, I think it's the next one. Uh, in a few more uh, rag oriented tasks like summarization or question answering. And there, they also show that purely off of human preference, so not, on, not just on hard metrics, but with human preference, there's also quite competitive with both Cloud 3 and GPT-4. Uh, so quite a good, um, a good solution for people that don't want to rely on open AI. And I think that we're, go we're going to continue to see this spreading more widely. Uh, companies know that RAG is quite a hot solution for many problems. and it makes sense to tune your language model to, to be aware of it. Yeah, definitely. Embeddings models uh, are uh, continuing to be to evolve to meet the demands of various RAG solutions. Uh, if you were interested in the um, uh, in the uh, UNUM uh, multimodal embeddings, uh, there's an interview on our neural search talks channel with Ash Vardanian, the founder of UNUM, uh, about hacking and uh, uh, low-level code optimization for um, for performance and uh, their whole vision of the AI ecosystem and uh, why they produce embeddings and vector search and uh, all these other libraries. Um, so, um, yeah, we're also in the RAG space. We are, uh, with Zeta Alpha, working on a um, on platform to provide um, uh, neural search uh, in combination with the latest uh, generative uh, large language models in a secure and enterprise ready way for, to discover and organize their own knowledge. Um, RAG is at the center of that. So this is a quick uh, snapshot of our whole uh, architecture. Uh, so it's kind of, um, um, yeah, you experiment with RAG in, in your own environment and then Eventually, you would like to deploy things in production in enterprise, and that's where uh, the Zeta Alpha platform comes in. Uh, and of course, you guys might know us as well uh, for our AI discovery platform, which is that uh, infrastructure, uh, but then um, specialized to help you find the latest AI papers and round up the news uh, and, and the latest developments and trends in the AI space. Uh, so check that out at zalpha.com. Um, and the star of all of that is indeed retrieval augmented generation, uh, the recipe to um, be able to do uh, LLMs on proprietary information with reference to um, 
you know, grounding of um, answers in in facts and in your own documents and the ability to trace that back to um, to you know, documents that you can fact check um, and really a retrieval augmented generation has kind of um, uh, put a, um, a lot of emphasis on retrieval uh, quality right so if you have uh, kind of the, the standard rack pattern where you template maybe um, uh, five passages or ten passages into the prompts to create an answer uh, whether they are uh, green or red in this diagram like relevant or uh, slightly irrelevant makes a lot of difference so that's where a lot of the uh, interest um, from our team in embeddings and um, and vector search comes from. Um, just want to briefly make a detour into something that we are working on right now. Um, so the standard drag is kind of yeah question answering, right? And the question is in one of the top uh, relevant passages that you retrieve. But what if you need all the answers? What if you have a question like? You know, pattern search, or you want to do research on a particular topic. You want to know what's all that we know about this topic. What's what are all the different um, um, patterns or compounds that have been tried in this particular lab setting, or what is everything that we know about this uh, market or this topic? Um, so one of the rag variants that has been um, uh, popularized in the last few months is RAG Fusion, where basically you take the original user query um, question and you can you take an LLM not only to to answer it and to uh, template uh, retrieval results into it, but you also generate different variants of that same query, which kind of highlight different aspects of the question. So that pattern is called the RAG Fusion, and then basically each query retrieves a different set of documents, some of which are relevant and some. Uh, not so much. And then uh, rank fusion basically uses a reciprocal rank fusion to um, re-rank that, that whole bunch of uh, retrieval results and then do the classical rank. So right now we're working on a slightly more uh, uh, interesting pattern, which basically takes our regilo evaluation uh, metric where we use um, basically GPT-4 as an evaluator of search results. And we are able to pick out the green and the red ones while they're being generated. So the, we started work on this new uh, REC Fusion estimate uh, uh, um, solution, which basically does the same as REC Fusion, but instead of just merging all the search results, um, evaluates them for relevance using a very powerful model. And assuming that when you want to have all the answers, you don't need them super fast, you can iterate multiple times and um, feed back to the uh, original agent, which uh, specializes in creating different queries. And say, oh, I've got a lot of these type of results. Maybe let's try another aspect of the question, which I haven't covered yet. And while you're doing that in iterations, you estimate um, the likelihood of uh, uh, getting more. So basically, when you have a question like one that we use a lot for our uh, hardware uh, review, um, what kind of hardware accelerators are used in AI? You specialize that in different into different questions. Regilo evaluates the relevant documents. Uh, ultimately, re by reading all those relevant documents, can create a very comprehensive answer. And based on evaluation of that answer, can identify kind of a refinement for the second pass, which will then create another uh, round of this. So that's uh, a short detour into some of our roadmap and, and uh, uh, product development. So um, let's dive back into the research papers for this month. Some of them touch upon- Of course, uh, yeah. Of this uh, we see this bit. trend where research papers and product releases are quite closely tied together, but there's also some uh, wild cards that uh, we love deep diving deeper into. Uh, so let's, uh, yeah. yeah, for here we can see robotics, uh, audio processing, multilingual, multimodal models, language models, the usual suspects. So we didn't pick one from each cluster, but uh, we're slightly biased towards RAG and LLMs in our selection. But I think we are actually, for this episode, we have quite a high coverage of these. Yeah. Yeah. 
so uh, this was one of last week, right? Mm -hmm. Gecko by um, Google DeepMind. Right. So uh, I guess everyone was kind of wondering where where Gemini and all this uh, revolution to towards the state of the art for Google meant. So. Of course, they want to be on the forefront for embedding models as well, and this is yeah, they didn't really have any good mm -hmm. uh, embedding models for a while now, right? Right. So I guess this is uh, an homage to uh, Inpars and Prontagator in terms of distilling knowledge from language models to embedding models. Um, so what they this whole premise is that you have a language model that's very powerful and has some knowledge about retrieval or relevance between uh, queries and passages. So you want to distill that in, in, in the form of uh, um, positive and negative mining. So you take a passage from your unlabeled corpus, you pass it through a language model to generate a query, and then using that generated query, you retrieve again uh, a top 20 list of results. And then you, uh, as you retrieve with an embedding model, you then ask a language model to re-rank this selection mm -hmm. and use a top and bottom as a positive and a negative. So I guess the innovation here is first that you no longer just treat the original uh, pair as a positive passage, as a positive pair, but instead you pick the new top, which might have been uh, even more relevant to the question. Mm -hmm. And then you also use the top 20 and take the bottom uh, as a negative, which I guess, depending on the use case, this could vary because maybe you, to top, 20, top 20 is not enough. Uh, but in terms of benchmarking, so in MTEB and Beer, this actually leads to a very capable model for its size. It's 1 billion parameters, but with just 700 dimensions, it can outcompete all uh, behemoths like the uh, text embedding three or um, if I've missed wrong, all that. Yeah. Well, it's lagging a little bit behind the large 7 billion parameter models. Right. But I, I, yeah, I would say. But I guess you could train them using the same strategy. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But I think here with what they show is that. Uh, this this LLM uh, distillation process is very powerful and can punch up above its weight because. But I'm still uh, left questioning kind of why they didn't try to uh, fine tune um, seven billion parameter models with this. Maybe it didn't work. Maybe they they're doing this as we speak. Who knows? Yeah. So is Gecko kind of the uh, the embedding sister model to Gemma? The yeah, I think so. I think so. Although this again is not open is, model. Is this one open? This is not one. Is not open source. No, not, so it's, not it's yet. Just uh, behind an API in Vertex. Ah, it's been released as an API. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is a product. Um, well, Google open up those models. Um, this is some examples, yeah. The example right? is taking the top and the bottom being better fit than the original. Okay. Very interesting paper. So um, the, the second paper on our list for this month is a uh, more classical uh, information retrieval paper. It's a um, uh, paper called Follow IR, Evaluating and Teaching Information Retrieval Models to Follow Instructions. Um, and it's kind of um, more a benchmark that they release, uh, a, a data set for uh, measuring how well information retrieval models are able to follow instructions, mm -hmm. right? In recent um, months, we've seen a lot of these, uh, I think Grid LM is also an example of mm -hmm. that. And there's a couple of other uh, IR models which really prepend the instruction of how to answer the query to, uh, to as, as a prompt to generating um, uh, the embedding. Right. And I think that's kind of inspired. You worked on this as well, right? When you do beer, mm -hmm. you have a lot of these weird, that weird tasks like Arguana or uh, Quora duplicate detection. Then having the right instructions is really, mm -hmm. really helps. And I think right? it also helped Gecko. They didn't put too much emphasis, but they also did the specialization per. Yeah. And per Prompt task. the Gator did the exactly. same thing. And so that's kind of a, a, a hidden trick of like, uh, adjusting the prompt a little bit to deal with this special type of task. So in this paper, they were kind of inspired by the old information retrieval community practice that comes from Trek, from the Trek conference, that the uh, searchers get this kind of narrative, mm -hmm. which explains what to do when evaluating the relevance of search results. So they kind of distill these narratives into instructions and then um, they built a data set of those. And um, more than just uh, releasing this data set, uh, they have this clever thing where they slightly perturb these instructions by a more negative, like a restrictive thing. 
and then they can measure using this new metric called PMRR um, whether the relevant documents from the model uh, with the more restrictive mm -hmm. instructions are actually kind of following that restriction. Uh, and because it's more restrictive, you only have to ha manually uh, label uh, the documents that were already relevant. You don't have to do a new relevant judgment. So it's a pretty neat trick and a nice data set. And they show that uh, if you actually fine tune uh, a Mistral 7 billion model on these instructions, it does really well on uh, uh, a couple of um, large uh, information retrieval test sets, not beer, but actually more serious ones. So the third one, draft. Draft. So uh, again, on this whole craze about, about drag and how models, language models need to know some information about the domain and knowledge that you won't have in your pre-training. Um, in this paper, uh, what they propose to do is to do this uh, rag aware fine tuning. So the model can both learn the domain knowledge, but also learn how to use retrieval artifacts within the prompt. And the analogy that they use in the paper, which I quite like, is that you want to treat a language model how you how a human operates during an open book exam. Mm -hmm. You don't always just, it's not like you in an open book exam, you just have the raw material and you just paste answers in. You have to process and know something about it to perform well. So what they train the model essentially on is you have uh, question and passage pairs, which they enhance with um, destructor documents. So uh, they experiment, I think, with the top five or top 10 retrieval results. And then they also use chain of thought to generate the answer based on the uh, Oracle document and this destructor um, artifacts. And they also specify that for a fraction of the training samples, they don't actually involve any uh, Oracle or relevant documents. And they only use noise essentially to teach the model some information from the domain so it can memorize and uh, internalize. Mm -hmm. um, and as we can see, uh, I guess it's a bit quite a, an easy benchmark to beat since most of these models are uh, very generic or haven't been fine-tuned for RAG, but it, it does show that the model has a huge performance benefit by doing this uh, approach. So they also use this uh, in DSF, they mean that you only fine-tune uh, without this RAG setup, and it seems to be beneficial for PubMed and questioners <laughs> and, and other benchmarks where uh, the goal is to retrieve code and answer a question. Um, and I think also what's interesting is they do some ablation studies to see uh, how many uh, passages you it's ideal to put in the in the prompt, and also how uh, flexible is the model between changes in the number of training samples, training documents in, uh, in prompt versus at the test time. And they seem to find that it's actually quite beneficial for most tasks to have this number of irrelevant documents and uh, no relevant document samples in training. And that also models trained with this uh, raft approach, they are quite robust. When you show them just five, you can then show them 20 if needed uh, in the inference time. So I think it's a really uh, nice method and people start integrating it. From Stanford, right? Uh, this paper, I think, yeah, RAFT. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another RAG paper, um, this one from a, a Korean uh, team from various universities in Korea, Adaptive RAG. Um, kind of plays on this uh, notion that people are that you have like simple question answering using retrieval augmented generation, and you can have very complex agentic uh, type of models which iterate like the one I was explaining. Uh, but then they are very expensive, right? They 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 take a lot of computation. They do many they consume many tokens, and um, um, so it's kind of wasteful for simple questions to throw them into these very complex models. So this is a fairly simple idea that they show in this adaptive rag paper that, yeah, you can kind of build this simple rag system and have a, a more complex rag agent with iterates. And then you just do basically intent recognition to separate out the, uh, with a simple LLM type of uh, um, classifier, uh, which is few shotted or zero shotted. And then you just differentiate in, into which bucket you're going to throw the question and it's more efficient. And it actually turns out to have slightly higher uh, performance if you look at the evaluation uh, table here. Uh, of course, the classifier is not perfect. So adaptive rag is the best one of, of, of the evaluated uh, systems, 
but if you would have an oracle which would actually tell you which uh, agent gives the best performance uh, instead of the classifier, uh, the, the ceiling would be even higher. Um, this is a multimodal uh, model, right? From Apple. From Apple, From, yeah. Which uh, Apple has never released any models so far, and now all of a sudden they they're entering the game with this MM1. Yeah, in, in spite of all the talks, we hope we, uh, like who's gonna power yeah, the new iPhones. Uh, yeah, Gemini and, and OpenAI were rumored to be in talks with Apple exactly. last month, but nothing came out of that. So yeah, far, I don't right? think anything is settled. No. And this uh, this paper is quite actually uh, detailed about how they built and how they train and all the experiments they did to to find the best parameters. Uh, it doesn't lead in any open source models, but they just document the whole process. Um, and highlight the important aspects that uh, they felt like the community should know to avoid wasting uh, compute. Uh, so what they mostly experimented with was the composition of the training data, which as we know is very important. Um, aspects such as the uh, image encoder used and specifically the uh, resolution of the images that it supports or it outputs and the number of tokens that it produces and then that you pass over to the <coughs> LLM backbone. No. So it's really more a paper that shows we also we at Apple also know how to do mm -hmm. uh, LMM uh, research. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, is it actually um, rumored to be into uh, integrated into any products yet? No, I don't think so. But uh, they just find that uh, interestingly enough, that you can uh, make a long go a long way without any uh, multimodal data that's uh, captioned. So they find that pairs of images and text are very good for zero shot, mm -hmm. but for few shot and uh, reasoning that you just need uh, interleave data which you can easily find from the internet. That yeah. don't, you don't have to have a, a very uh, tight, uh, tightly knit pairs of uh, images in their labels. Uh, and also they produce this, they, find, they take these findings and scale them up to build this 30 billion model, uh, which they claim state of the art in pre-training metrics. So what this means is uh, not any fine tuning on uh, downstream tasks, uh, I think it's in the next slide. Um, yeah, here is what I what I said about scaling up the uh, image resolution and this training mixture where it really uh, leads performance gains. And for the performance, as, as you expect, um, a 30 billion model is a bit hard to compete with the GPT-4 vision, but they show that after fine tuning on some of the data uh, is not always but better. In the next do we have that benchmark yeah. here? Oh yeah. 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 So. There are benchmarks like VQA where uh, this model is quite competitive, yeah. and there are others where, of course, it's not uh, yeah. state of the art. But I think it's more than welcome for a thirty billion model. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Eighty three on visual question answering, uh, beating both Gemini and and GPT four vision. Yeah. Um, all right, we need to speed up a little bit. So um, as we're coming towards the end of the hour, uh, Jamba was a really. Uh, um, an, a nice uh, release from um, AI21 from Israel. It's a hybrid between uh, the currently popular Mamba models, uh, which are more kind of recurrent, and transformer modules. So they, they design this kind of hybrid architecture, uh, and they add um, a mixture of expert uh, flavor to it as well. And basically, uh, uh, it's a um, it's a product release from AI21, so you can, uh, you can you can try it out, which can take very large context and basically mm -hmm. uh, process them much faster than uh, purely transformer based models, um, and also um, uh, load much uh, higher context lengths into a single uh, GPU. Um, it's an open weights model, so you can actually uh, uh, download it as well and, and play with it. And um, the paper is interesting because it kind of speculates on where the transformer is really strong in in context mm -hmm. learning, yeah. um, and purely Mamba based models are not. And this hybrid seems to have like a good balance between uh, those two. But what do you think? Is this still a transformer, or is the transformer dead? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, the. the, the I don't know. Does architecture matter? I think it's an engineering question, That's right? If it fits on my hardware and it's fast enough, I'm fine with it. Uh, and indeed, they show that it's competitive also with sort of mixed trial and, and, and other um, uh, state-of-the-art models, you know, open source models. 
Um, so um, I think this is the last one that we can seriously go into. So um, this uh, uh, also kind of plays into that computational efficiency trend, right? Right. So it's a paper from uh, DeepMind, and people on Twitter were quite surprised that they got permission to publish this. Yeah. So um, apparently it's not going into any of their products. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what he proposes to dynamically allocate compute on specific tokens at each layer level. So instead of uh, using all of the tokens in your self-attention and your MLP computations, mm -hmm. uh, you choose uh, in, a sim in a setup where they just, that they describe similar to mixture of experts. But at this point, you don't choose the expert that the token will go to, but you choose whether the token will go into the layer at all or skip it with a residual connection. Right. So like different tokens uh, uh, actually get processed by different numbers of exactly. layers. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see here in this uh, purple and orange diagram, uh, they show that uh, the first token might go a few layers deep and then the next one might skip some and then go back on and then off. Mm. So it's they're proposing that um, basically some tokens, you don't really need to process them for long to get all the context out of them. Yeah. Uh, and they, they say that during training, this doesn't add any slowdown. Our performance, again, is equal, but it's up to 50 times, 50% uh, 50 faster. And do they share weights between all the different layers or the, all the uh, layers trained like end-to-end? Uh, -end I think it's, the, yeah, yeah they're, the trained, they're trained end-to-end. -end. Yeah. So that's interesting. They also have this uh, graph where they show uh, this isomorphism between uh, dense models and that there are no none of these mixture of depth components. And they show that you can actually, uh, since you don't use all of the all of your model, you can make it a bit bigger and then uh, perform faster and better at the task. Yeah. I was reminded a little bit um, uh, by this approach, uh, quite an older paper from 2019 to Angela Fan, which was layer dropout, uh, where basically, uh, yeah, diff different different. Uh, Numbers of layers were just omitted at computation time, or the universal transformer from Mustafa Degani and all, uh, which also kind of had this notion of variable computation uh, depth. So um, some of them are cited in the in this. Uh, there was a recent other paper about the unreasonable ineffectiveness of deeper layers, yes, yeah. which also kind of plays to the same thing. So it seems that all these like super deep layers are highly redundant and a lot of that computation can be optimized. Um, I think we'll have to um, uh, just quickly shout out this one and not treat it in full detail. What's going on here? Long form factuality, it's yeah. a benchmark. So, so right? yeah, right? just as to benchmark how all well models uh, cite factual uh, uh, evidence in the answers they produce and how to benchmark this with LLMs. And they find actually that LLMs can judge this ability quite well. Yeah. Uh, and even in cases where they disagree with humans, three out of four, they beat humans. So right. humans make mistakes on whether something is factual or properly cited. And the idea is really simple. And I think we've tried many times before, uh, simply split up the answer from the LLM into, into more atomic facts and then fact check it with exactly. Google, yeah. right? Uh, uh, so nice paper, but not an extremely novel idea. This is a cool um, uh, demo uh, site or uh, like paper website that you should check out, um, mainly because of the cool videos. I was not able to capture the video very well here, but uh, basically it's a humanoid uh, robot, which is trained purely uh, using a, an end-to-end -end, um, um, uh, multimodal uh, transformer model, where basically all the locomotion step and the visual perception and all the um, uh, sort of um, uh, motor control stuff is just tokens that are fed into a single uh, transformer. Um, and um, one of the, the videos are nice, uh, but what is really uh, um, amazing is that they were able to kind of um, just uh, putting control tokens and then the a robot was able to walk backwards without ever being trained in that situation. So that was pretty nice. Uh, and the last one is a um, kind of uh, adversarial attack paper, right? Right. So they show that uh, just using your log probabilities in the uh, logit bias from an API, you can extract first very easily the dimensionality of the last layer and the hidden dimensions of the model. And also, if you have 
uh, enough money because you, you're using an API, yeah. you can extract actually the entire uh, embedding layer, embedding, embedding projection layer. It takes... Uh, right, but just doing enough probes and then getting um, the uh, the activations, mm -hmm. the logic activations. So stealing part of a production uh, language model, only the last layer, exactly. right? Yeah, it is part. <laughs> well, maybe the last layer is enough. I don't know if, if these other guys can throw away all these other layers. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we'll go back to like, uh, you know, simple perceptrons <laughs> at some point. And I think it's uh, interesting that another paper on exact same topic came out uh, one day after. Uh, that's this one, right? Yeah. Logits of API bracket LMs. So people are snooping around on their on APIs, so people should be careful. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, lots of trending code on GitHub. Some of it we already mentioned. Devin is an open source variant. Uh, Unum Cloud uh, with their uform and usearch. Grok, uh, lots of other stuff. Open Sora, that's interesting. Have you checked it out? Yeah, but uh, I think on this uh, on the graph that we showed for Sora, they're still on the first <laughs> compute needed <laughs> right, right. step. Um, and uh, we want to close. Uh, thank you for for being here and close with this uh, um, uh, little homage to open source. So um, the MIT license is one of the uh, uh, most permissive uh, open source licenses, and of course, as um, researchers, but also as companies were quite happy when people release uh, their models open source, especially under an MIT license, because it kind of says, do with it whatever you want, just don't bother us and um, uh, provide this notice as part. And um, I think with um, the uh, um, new music models, even that very short, boring license, to any person obtaining a copy of this software and associated documentation files the software to deal in the software without restriction including without limitation the rights to use copy modify merge publish distribute sublicense this, uh, and or sell copies of the <laughs> software and to permit persons to whom you can software is said, right? to do this would have been, so this would have been her next hit if you were just planning it <laughs> Right. The above copyright notice and this permission. No, unfortunately, we don't have time to play the full song, but it, I think it's it's touching. Yeah, there are lots of events coming up. Um, not uh, no time to shout out all of them, but I clear is definitely uh, a must see. Um, there's a couple of local events for those people interested in knowledge management and search. Check out Bite Size Game World Europe next week and Open Search Gone early May. Uh, and uh, our next uh, session here is going to be on the 3rd of May, Friday, uh, live from Lab 42. And if you're interested to check out the uh, uh, papers that we talked about, click that link. Uh, and uh, uh, they're uh, available in a tag in the Zeta Alpha platform. And uh, enjoy discovery with uh, Zeta Alpha and enjoy the next exciting month of AI development. Right. See you in May. Thank you. Thank you.